I want to begin with you, Doug, and, and really sort of delve deep into that story as to whether you should just continue doing that, fade the political talk, fade the noise, and focus on the earnings and the data. Uh, I, you know, I agree with that. And I also, you know, I like the fact here that, you know, after a 0.7 quarter of GDP growth in the first quarter, uh, you know, you've sort of marked down uh, economic hopes. And, you know, we watched the Citigroup Economic Surprise Index pretty closely. You know, that's retraced from a very high level down all the way below zero. So I think, you know, you've cleared the decks on some of these very inflated expectations for the economy that emerged following uh, last fall's presidential election. I think that's a good thing. It sort of, you know, sets the table for some upside surprises, both in earnings, which we've seen, and for the economy, which I think uh, we'll see now over the next few months. Frank, so I agree is, with that. Is, is that why, when you look at the technicals, that we've seen such a resilient uptrend on the S&P 500? I know that's the way you look at the charts right now. Right. Well, I think so far the same pattern has been playing out now as to what we saw during Brexit and the U.S. election, where we saw a, a pullback in the few weeks from March to the middle of April before the first round of the French election, and then a relief rally since. We haven't seen the emphatic break to the upside just yet, but I think the S&P set up to do so, and it would have a target at least short term to a 2430. And I think also we have to remi remind ourselves, looking at the chart there, that all of this is still occurring within the confines of the upper, upward sloping channel that began in February 2016. So that continues, I believe the advance can continue as well. What's behind it, Frank? I mean, we kept, how long have we been saying now that this bull market has really run its course, and now we get a new leg up? Right. Well, I, one phrase I keep going back to is that the reaction to the news is more important than the news itself. So this is, I think there's one example that can really prove this. I have a little pop quiz for you guys. Yeah. Over the last 12 months, what date do you think had the S&P had its biggest advance? Well, I can tell you that pretty much everyone around this table over the last 12 months would turn around and say it was the day after the election. Right. We're close. It was actually the day before the election. Yeah. Um, Monday, November 7th, the market was up 2.2%. Which is really in, surprising. Right, really anticipation surprising. of. I didn't remember that, actually. I don't remember <laughs> that. I was here. Right. We were covering it. I didn't remember it. So it's just interesting that yeah. the market was anticipating a different result. And well, I think the market was largely anticipating it just being over. Exactly. I mean, there was a lot of uncertainty going into that election, and people just said, just get it over so we know what we're dealing with. With a clear victory. And so I think the market shows that it can absorb news um, and going back to its underlying trend, which has been so far up. So I think the market can't do that f forever, but as long as it does, we have to continue to respect it now. Doug Ramsey, there's two headlines in this market in the last 24 hours. One is uh, an all-time high in the equity market. We hold those levels. And the other is the 24-year low in the VIX. What do you think of those two stories, and how do you reconcile them going forward from here? Uh, it's hard to reconcile the VIX against some of the other things that we see. I mean, you know, there's confidence in this market, but not. I don't detect, you know, just with some of the other measures uh, that we monitor, and just subjectively that there's quite that much complacency surrounding it. Uh, you know, if you look at like the 10-day put-to-call ratio, another option-derived indicator, you know, that's still so showing some anxiety after uh, uh, the weakness we had for, you know, a couple months until we finally broke out uh, last week. So, I, you know, I don't, yeah. I think sentiment is actually just a little more uh, worried maybe than, you know, the, the VIX would indicate. That, that's been our view. Frank, you can look at the uptrend on the S&P 500, the downtrend in the VIX just as pronounced. What are those two stories telling you at the moment? Right. Well, I don't think we can glean too much from the VIX being lower. And just because the reason you point out, John, is that the market's going up, the VIX goes down. It's a simple story. It continues yeah. to happen. But I think there are also other indicators of volatility that we can look at. And one simple one is just tracking how many large moves we have for the S&P. So, so far in 2017, there has been um, three 1% moves, two advances and one decline. Compare that to last year, um, through the t this time last year, there were 31 different 1% moves, just about even. So I believe that shows that there's currently, you know, some investor indifference. But indifference is the friend of an uptrend, even though it tends to be boring to sit through every day.